Peace. This is Kamal Supreme, a.k.a. Kamal Lamani. I was born in Harlem, grew up in the Bronx, introduced to gangs, drugs, violence, all of that stuff. And I didn't get the memo, like a lot of people. I didn't get the memo. I wasn't supposed to make it. So now that I miraculously slipped through the cracks and made it through from the streets to the suites, I want to share with you some of the things that I learned, some of the techniques, some of the wisdom, some of the jewels. I want to drop some jewels on you so you can take it with you when you are out here soldiering, when you are out here hustling and doing your thing. I want you to make it. I want you to succeed. And I want to give you some more of what you need. Because many teachers aren't going to tell you. Some family members aren't going to tell you. Some principals and guidance counselors aren't going to tell you. But I'm going to tell you some of the small things that are very important that will help you to succeed. So check it out. Rock with me. Roll with me. Let's go. Let's get it. I wasn't supposed to make it. The miraculous transformation of a boy from the hood. Peace, success, prosperity, and abundance. One love.
wasn't supposed to make it by Kamal Imani. Chapter 2. First impressions are lasting ones. Imagine if some of your first impressions of life, your dominant childhood memories, were of being robbed in your apartment by men with stockings over their faces and wielding swords when you were five years old. Posters of mug shots of a man who was going around town trying to cut little boy's penises off. A man shaking as he stood against an apartment building while another man was pointing a gun at him, ready to shoot. You running from a bully and almost getting hit by a car that missed you by less than an inch. Rats, roaches, flying water bugs. Your little sister getting kidnapped by her father and your mother fainting twice and having nervous breakdowns. A little boy at the age of six getting chased in the supermarket by a 16 year old for his money and groceries. And police interrogating you about joining a gang and allegedly stealing a woman's pocketbook from her baby stroller, all before the age of seven. Well, these were my first impressions of life in America in Harlem and the Bronx in particular. This was in the early 1970s, but as I travel the country and other parts of the world, I don't see much change. With a diverse variety of people, places, things, timing, and most of all, desire and intuition, I was able to navigate this strange and threatening world, beat the odds, and challenge my first impressions. I've been through many trials and tribulations, but I found that life is what you make it, and you can create your own reality. In the next chapters, I will share with you some of my experiences and the insights that were gained in the hopes that you can get the memo earlier than I did. Lesson. Your first impressions in life may not be of the stuff you see on hip-hop videos and Hollywood red carpet lifestyles. But most successful people started from the bottom, now they're here. They went all the way up, and it wasn't easy. Everyone has a story to tell. So you must master yourself and go for your dreams and goals so you can tell your story that can help the next person. In other words, you can change your first impression of life. It's all a matter of perception, how you look at things. You must develop the courage to challenge your fears and move away from the pack. To not worry about what your peers think about you. People must ride or die, be fully committed with you, or fall back. Like the rapper actor Ludacris said, move, get out the way, so you can create your own lane and win the game. With a diverse variety of people, places, things, timing, and most of all, desire and intuition. I was able to navigate this strange and threatening world, beat the odds, and challenge my first impressions. I've been through many trials and tribulations, but I found that life is what you make it, and you can create your own reality. In the next chapters, I will share with you some of my experiences and the insights that were gained in the hopes that you can get the memo earlier than I did. I Wasn't Supposed to Make by Kamal Lamani. Chapter 3. You gotta believe. Don't let anyone say you can't make it. That's a quote from Love Bug Starsky, hip hop pioneer. Do you believe that when you get a cut on your finger or arm, that your body will heal it? Do you believe that when you catch a cold, that it will be gone in a few days? Of course you do. We expect nature to take care of it. Some call it the God within. Others call it Ra, Chi, or Kundalini energy. No matter what you call it, you expect for it to change for the best. There are many situations that arise in our lives that at first seem unbearable. We don't think we can handle it. But when we believe and keep the faith through tests, trials, and tribulations, we find out that God, nature, life, the universe has mercy on us. 
Once you start helping yourself and you have no intention of stopping, you will blaze a trail wherein people will have no choice but to attract to you, and many may desire to assist and support you. It all began with you believing in yourself. In my case, I was taught a strong sense of God when I was born, so I learned to believe in myself and in a higher power. Even when people thought that my level of faith was uncommon, I would be blessed favorable outcomes and situations. lesson. Your first impressions in life may not be of the stuff you see on hip-hop videos and Hollywood red carpet lifestyle, but most successful people started from the bottom, now they're here. They went all the way up, and it wasn't easy. Everyone has a story to tell, so you must master yourself and go for your dreams and goals so you can tell your story that can help the next person. In other words, you can change your first impression of life. It's all a matter of perception, how you look at things. You must develop the courage to challenge your fears and move away from the pack. To not worry about what your peers think about you, people must ride or die, be fully committed with you, or fall back. Like the rapper and actor Ludacris said, move, get out the way, so you can create your own lane and win the game. With a diverse variety of people, places, things, timing, and most of all, desire and intuition, I was able to navigate this strange and threatening world, beat the odds, and challenge my first impressions. I've been through many trials and tribulations, but I found that life is what you make it, and you can create your own reality. In the next chapters, I will share with you some of my experiences and the insights that were gained in the hopes that you can get the memo earlier than I did. I wasn't supposed to make it by Kamal Amani. Chapter four, avoiding career self-conflict and indecision. My best friends, Fuquan and Shabazz's father, Mr. Young, once gave us some sound advice which was excellent for that time and still holds some weight in this technological and economic era. Their advice was, get a job working for a company, start at the bottom and work your way up to the top with emphasis on management. I wish I would have taken his advice. In my teenage and young adult years, the economy was so good that you could quit a job today and find a new one tomorrow. You could curse out your boss, kick the furniture, and leave and find a new job the next day. So I must have worked for at least seven retail stores. If I didn't like the way someone spoke to me, I was out. Sometimes I'd go away for a year or so, and they'd still take me back. I was spoiled. Now with hindsight being 2020, I realized that if I would have stayed at one of those jobs, and work my way up, I'd probably not just be a senior executive, but probably a franchise owner. I did detect, witness, and experience a certain degree of disrespect and suspicion from the management and culture of some of these companies. They would attract high school and college graduates and many from the inner city and give them low pay and little to no benefits, with the exception of the store discount and expect them to grin, smile, work hard, solicit store credit cards, and provide exceptional customer service while earning a little over minimum wage. But I learned not to be so sensitive and emotional because that's a big mistake in the workplace. They don't care if your aunt just died or if your baby is sick. All they care about is the bottom line, which is the profit margin. They may smile and walk around upbeat, 
But at the end of the day, what do the financial reports say? So you have to come in with your goal in mind, even if it's McDonald's or Foot Locker. If you have something for them, they will have something for you. You can rise up in any company or in your own business, but your goals have to be clear. Your sense of clarity will resonate at your job interview and your dynamic attitude will shine for yourself and your family. Now, I knew deep in my heart, mind and soul, that my interest was rapping, promoting shows, broadcasting, history, teaching, and astronomy. Everyone in my family encouraged me to do everything except what I wanted to do. So when I went to Bergen Community College, because I found that without a degree, people who seemed less intelligent than me were in superior positions, and it was beginning to make me feel angry, like I was missing something that was an absolute necessity of this world. At Bergen, I first registered for education courses so I could be a teacher. Then people started telling me that at that time, teachers didn't make any more than retail. So I switched my major to business. I was good in general business courses, mathematics, elementary statistics, marketing, but I could not get those debits and credits right in accounting. The professor was tough and impatient and embarrassingly loud. So I knew that once I scored low on a few quizzes, etc., that I'd better withdraw from the class before I failed. Accounting was a requirement for the business major, so I switched my major to communications. They were making very corny commercials and had no TV or radio station. And then people told me, you have to have connections in broadcasting. You have to know somebody. Well, I had now been there for over two years. I had commuted on their always late bus that would take you all around the county just to get to the college. Sometimes in the cold, icy winter, it wouldn't show up. I had been working my retail jobs and balancing school and work. I was tired of it all. I had accumulated 74 credits. I went to the guidance counselor who said, we can put these together and give you an associate's degree in professional studies, which is equivalent to a liberal arts degree. And that's what happened. Luckily, I was able to transfer most of those credits when I went back to school at NYIT, New York Institute of Technology, for my bachelor's in sociology with a minor in psychology. That is what I needed to teach at that time. So yes, about 20 years later, I ended up going back to school for one of the things that they had taught me out of, teaching. I also have a public access TV show, an internet TV show, and I've created films, music, videos. So, you want to be clear from the start about what you want. I later went into real estate and sold a few homes, but my newborn son had arrived, and I felt I was taking too much time from my new family. I do have a desire to invest in more properties as I currently own some real estate. I had went to computer school. I let them steer me into Microsoft Office environment when I should have done programming or PC tech. But I truly didn't understand the art of negotiating or when and how to truly speak up for myself. I was blessed that positive thinking gave me a positive self-image and I learned to turn all of my career twist and turns into what I consider expert or consultant experience. I learned along the way that consultants get paid for helping people and businesses solve their problems. And I have learned almost every aspect of how to run a successful business. So you must use the ability to recreate yourself. You must use the ability to recreate yourself. Because even if you don't realize it, you are always selling and or marketing yourself. Lesson. This is called the art of recreating yourself or repackaging yourself. Because if you're aware or not, you're always selling yourself. As Jay-Z says, the streets are watching. Get clear on who you are and what you want to do.
I wasn't supposed to make it by Kamal Amani. Chapter 5, The Box with My Father Again. One of the weirdest psychological understandings in the black community is how we know that what we do is wrong at times and we forgive each other. We know that deadbeat dads are wrong and many of us get mad, hate, and hold grudges but I believe that most of us unconsciously know that the breakdown of the family is due to the system of white supremacy racism as Dr. Francis Crest Wilson has educated us on and what Dr. Joy DeGroy has termed post-traumatic slavery syndrome. We inherently know that since the institution of enslavement, we were never taught how to be men again and all that it entails in modern society. Well, the family story goes as told by my mother, that when I was three and the family was at our apartment for a party, my father was watching the game on TV and the ladies wanted to watch something else. My mother told this to my father and he objected. My mother went to turn the channel and my father hit her. Then my great aunt Marlene from the Bronx, who sometimes had a few drinks in her, as well as a quick temper, jumped on my father and said, don't you hit my niece. And this was the cause of the breakup. And just a FYI, I had also heard that previous to this, my aunt Marlene had pushed my father into an open manhole on 125th Street in Harlem. I want to be clear that when I say fatherless, I don't mean that I didn't know my father or ever see him. I probably saw him about three times per year on the average. He was a Jehovah's Witness, well, on Sundays and religious occasions, but as a teenager, I saw a few grimy things going on that they would have kicked him out for. So he would take me to their conventions in Buffalo, New York, and Yankee Stadium. From the time I was around five until my pre-teens, when I refused to go. I thought it was so cartoonish. These people would dress up as Moses, Noah, Mary, Peter, Jesus and the 12 disciples, etc. and put on this biblical play. It looked so childish to me. I couldn't stand it. He only spanked me a couple of times. When my mother gave him bad news about school or when my little sister kept throwing shoes out of the window, my shoes out of the window, and my mother thought I was losing my shoes and she would make me strip to my underoos and beat me with a belt buckle. Then he would beat me again when I see him. But why'd you spray me outside of Yankee Stadium, Dad? That is embarrassing. He'd take me around the Bronx and Harlem to visit and meet with my family. That's on his side. He would love to fight with my male cousins, play fight. They would really bang up the house. I cried when I was young thinking that they were going to hurt him. They would jump him. It would be two on one, three on one, four on one, and he'd come up unscathed. I later learned that he really could fight, and he had street cred in Harlem. No one wanted to mess with him. His name was Carlton. He was a Golden Gloves boxer for a time. When he was a superintendent on Riverside Drive on 151st Street in Washington Heights, we'd walk out of the apartment door, and if the Dominicans, Colombians, or African Americans were standing around, and if they gave him any kind of look, he would start trash talking real loud. Can't no man beat me. No man could beat me from here to Africa. If you think so, then come on and try. I'm going to go and walk up this hill, and if you ain't ready now, I'll be back. Then he'd make a fist and dare anyone to try to twist his fist or arm around, and no one could ever do it. My pops was born in August, and he was the true definition of a Leo and an alpha male. When he would try to teach me how to box on about three occasions, he was so skilled that I could never be able to hit or kick him once. I'd throw haymaker, and he'd stand in one place and block everything and laugh hysterically. If I would have went after uh, most kids my age with that same fervor, I would have killed him. 
He reminded me of Muhammad Ali with his ego and trash talk. He also would buy his 98 Oldsmobiles in full and tell me that he liked big cars because they were safer and he would also wear big fur coats and leather and was always clean cut. When we would go into restaurants like the famous Wilson's and Chock Full of Nuts, he would flirt with the waitresses and crack jokes and have them crying laughing. The one joke I never liked is when people would ask him how many children he had and he would say, I don't know, I have so many I can't count them all. <laughs> So I really admired and loved my father. It's just that I didn't get to learn basic things such as how to use tools, how to tie a tie and wear a suit, how to use a condom, and the importance of making money to take care of your family as the priority. My mother would sometimes become financially drained, stressed, and would ask my father and my sister's father, my stepfather, for money so she could take care of the kids and it would get so bad that sometimes she had to take them to court for child support. As a young boy, this really hurt me. When I was a young teen, I got a paper route and did small jobs. My boys and I would go to Delancey Street in New York, 3rd Avenue in the Bronx, and other hot spots in the city in Inglewood, New Jersey to buy our fresh gear, clothes. This is how I would try to take the burden off the clothes bill off of my mother and I started buying a lot of food for the house. We needed him most when I decided to go to Bergen Community College in Paramus, New Jersey and Morehouse in Atlanta. I needed books. Those books were expensive. I also needed money for transportation and food, etc. My mother used to get on that phone and beg my father. He would say things like, I don't have it now. I didn't hit the number this week. My mother would have to put my grandmother, the Strictly Business Sugar Pie, on the phone and all of a sudden tell my son to come and pick it up or meet me in the city. He would say, tell my son to come and pick it up or meet me in the city. The Sugar Pie was a no joke. The money would appear. It was like, why are you giving my mother a hard time? I worked with him for a couple of weeks at the Riverside Drive building. Until they could get a new porter, the building management allowed me to be the substitute porter as my father was the superintendent. I would take out all of the upper class black garbage that they would leave by the door. I would paint, mop, carry radiators. I remember that heavy, heavy radiator. And I would move furniture. My father would have some shady characters, bums, come around and help him, help us. He would be real sarcastic with them, and they were yes men to him. I would also see the management and my father disappear with this chick in one of the many rooms in the huge basement of the building. They'd be gone for hours, like I was a bo bo the fool. I was about 18 then. My older half-brother and sister never wanted anything to do with me and my little sisters from my mother's side of the family. They were salty over however my father went from their mother to my mother. I still don't know the half of that. I also had a little sister named Tanisha, who my father had when he was at least 50 years old. She was his little angel and could do no wrong. Her mother was Haitian and she lived in Washington Heights. So at the age of four, she could speak Spanish, English, and French. When she got to about 14 and started talking to boys, he called me and asked that I could come to New York and take her to lunch to see if I could talk some sense into her because he was scared that these young hood boys was going to mess up her life. Her and I kicked it and she assured me not to worry she understood his concern, but we had a great day. She was a fine one, too. She looked like she could have been one of Russell Simmons and Tamori's daughters. When I walked with her, I knew Cat's thought she was my girl. It was mad funny. I always wanted to bring her out to Jersey and mess with my friend's heads. <laughs> but she passed away of cancer in her early 30s. Another highlight 
of me and my father's interactions was when my then fiance and his new wife got in my Ford wagon to take him to his hometown of Southern Pines, North Carolina for a quick and urgent family weekend trip. I was about 26 then. First after us driving for 11 hours, he wanted my wife and I to shower and nap at my Uncle AC's house. I told him that I'd rather go to the Motel 8 that we passed down the street. He got so mad and went on a rant about, this is your uncle, and why waste money? In my head, I was like, I ain't seen them since I was around seven. I don't know these people like that. We chilled at the motel, enjoyed the pool and everything. On the way back to New York, he fell to sleep when it was his turn to drive. He was supposed to switch in Virginia, so I reluctantly kept driving. My then fiance doesn't like driving on the highways, and his wife doesn't drive. At first, he was passing gas from his homemade saving money chicken sandwiches, and his feet were smelling like corn chips. But then he wakes up and starts talking about Farrakhan and the Million Man March. And at that time, my fiance and I was on some old, don't say nothing about Farrakhan. So we argued from Virginia to New York. When we arrived, my leg felt like it had needles in it. I could hardly move it from all the driving. My father did come to my wedding in Inglewood, New Jersey. He later moved back to North Carolina and attempted to start an antique shop with several tractor trailers worth of furniture that he salvaged from tenants who had moved out of the Riverside Drive apartment. The city down in North Carolina changed the business zoning laws on him so he couldn't do his business. He also went to court for buying some hot merchandise from some people who must have turned around and snitched on him. Then some family members, whom I won't mention at this time, aided the court to think he was crazy because he had dementia. They put him in a home three hours away from his wife, he doesn't drive. They put him on meds and almost allowed him not to use his leg to the point where he almost couldn't walk. People also had eyes on much of his property. Thanks to my wife and I going down there on several occasions, we prevented some of that. He is currently in a nursing home in Harlem. He can hardly speak correctly. He still likes to play fight and he loves to eat. His wife is there for him almost daily and I go to see him once in a while and it hurts so bad. Just as I grew older and matured and finally understood what my father was trying to do, my father was diagnosed with dementia. For a long time, I couldn't bring myself to visit him on a regular basis. It's funny how the mind works. I love Harlem. I was born and raised there. My family and I would visit from New Jersey at least twice a month. We love the culture of Harlem and supporting the vendors of the African diaspora. We always meet new people and we've developed strong and lasting relationships with vendors and store owners. We love the vegan spots like the Uptown Juice Bar and there's a Rastafarian spot too. Then, there's the all-you-can-eat manners, Sylvia's and Billy's Black, to name a few. We can get delicious bean pies from Manners or at Moss Number 7 on Sundays. There are great artists and clothing designers like my man Aaron McBride, a.k.a. A. Feather of the Black Rolling Stones. There are people selling CDs with black music running deep in all genres. If you could catch a good religious or historical debate, it would be very enriching too. But to simply stop by and see my father would cause all kinds of excuses and procrastination to emerge in my mind. To see this man who had reminded me of Muhammad Ali, not really remembering me at first, or I'm not sure if at all, really hurt. It hurt so bad that my youngest sister couldn't even visit at all because she was his favorite baby. My wife, son, and I would talk to him and try to get reactions from him. He's always uh, responding when I mention the golden gloves or boxing. 
He starts grinning and pounding his fist into his hands and starts mumbling some hardly audible stuff. He also knows when it's time to eat. He looks in the direction of the food and it appears. In his mid-80s, he's still incredibly strong. I back up when he starts reminiscing about fighting. Sometimes I can understand, like, one time he blurted out, I have a big house. I told him, yes you do, and we're taking care of it. I never imagined him in this condition. The other strange thing about it is that he outlived my mother, grandmothers, and grandfathers, most of his brothers, sisters, one of his sons, and two daughters. As far as I know, he doesn't know that they're gone. On a recent visit, he started weeping out loud. I was really taken aback because I never even seen him act like he was sad or depressed. I felt that he may have been reflecting on his mistakes or something. I don't know. But I wish I could talk and watch with him again. I Wasn't Supposed to Make It by Kamal Imani. Chapter 6 Father Figures. Iyala Van Zant said, Nature abhors a void. Meaning that when you are missing something, something will come to attempt to fill its place. There are several men that attempted in their own ways to provide guidance and tutelage, which I will always appreciate. But, as you will see, it was always bittersweet. In the absence of my father, my mother met and gave birth to my little sister, Kimberly Nefertari. Her father was an African nationalist and a member of the Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey's movement under the Honorable Carlos Cooks in Harlem. His African name was Chief Shaka Zulu Ramses. On many weekends, as little ones, Shaka would take Kim and I out to Harlem. He was loud and proud. He was also a very dominant and demanding personality. He would make us say, Assalamu alaikum almost every street vendor and random dashiki wearing person that we met. He would sometimes make us wear African clothes, kufis, and carry red, black, and green flags. He would loudly tell us to study science, math, typing, and accounting, and make ourselves in demand. He also said, with that, we can go and help build and rebuild Africa because the Western European colonists have destroyed them. He would sometimes set up shop in front of the Harlem State Building or African Square in Harlem, sell his flags, incense, and other African merchandise. Sometimes he would get on the loudspeaker and start dropping the history of the world and what the black man has to do. He was a walking encyclopedia. But for us little ones, a little overpowering and embarrassing Shaka would point people out as they came onto the subway train. You see those people there? Wearing those gray uniforms? They're civil servants. They work for the state. He would call my middle class grandmother, aunts, uncles, and cousins bourgeois Negroes. But my thinking was, man, you live in a room in Harlem and you share a bathroom with other tenants. He'd say, you know why the Spanish hate you? Because of the Moors. You know why the Italians hate you? Because of Hannibal. And he'd go on and I'd be like, everybody hates me? He was an atheist and he beat me up about Christianity and Islam. He didn't give the Rastas any props and he said the immigrant Africans are the same ones who put us in slavery and will kill us in a heartbeat if we disagree with their religion. Shaka was hard for didn't trust the nation of Islam or the five percent nation of gods and earth. I was like, who does this man like? He only had one arm. The story is that one hand and part of his arm was blown off when he was a child playing with firecrackers or fireworks. Shaka did instill in us a strong sense of racial pride, a strong history of Kemet, Egypt, and 
Africa as well as education. He also gave my sister a lot of money towards her education. He helped my mother when he could. I don't know what happened, but he and my mother didn't last long, but he always told me that he would always love her. We became closer as I became a teen and a young man because I had the most black consciousness in the family, so we could respectfully debate, but he'd always win. He'd say, you'll get it later. One night, I was on 42nd Street in Times Square with my girlfriend, Queen Medina. He was... <laughs> We was, we was lit up from the ganja spliff. And guess who we saw? Shaka. He had this sheepish grin on his face. And he said, Jumbo, which is an African greeting. Come on, what are you doing down here? And who is this beautiful African queen? And she replied, Medina. He said, Medina? Oh, nice to meet you. Take care of him. Y'all have a good night. Then he said to me, drink some milk. It will help get the high down. Damn, he messed me up. It was funny though. Shaka was at my wedding too. He had told some of the ladies that they had became <laughs> that they had become fat. And they were mad at him. He enjoyed the African drumming and my new wife Diane and I jumping the broom in my grandmother's beautiful backyard. I would say that 75% of the time that my family and I visit Harlem, we would run into Shaka. We'd sometimes hang out at the Jamaican restaurant. I think it was the Golden Crust. He was now in his 70s and started walking with the cane and later a walker. He started telling me that he wanted me to inherit his library. When he passed from prostate cancer, his daughter Rashida from another wife and I took at least four hours to clear out his Harlem public storage space of books and music and put it in our cars. There must have been at least 1,000 books. I was proud that he wanted me to have them. I remember visiting him one evening in the Bronx in hospice and my wife and I took videos of Dr. Ben and Dr. Clark, some of his favorite historians, on the phone, and he smiled and shook our hands and pumped his fist. I assisted in eulogizing him at a Harlem funeral home. Talk about growing character and having inner joy. Then there was Gramps. My grandmother's father was named James Clifford Mosley, and we called him Gramps. I loved Gramps. He was so cool and sweet. He was a laid back old man, probably in his late 70s and early 80s. He was always around my grandmother's sugar pies, Inglewood, New Jersey home, cooking. He liked to bake fruit, apples in particular. He would share them with the family and guests, and we would love it. Sometimes I'd wonder about Gramps. He used to tell me that he was a cook in the Navy, and that a long time ago, men used to wear dresses. My mother later told me that he was a homosexual, but I was like, well, how'd he have sugar pie anyway? What hurt me was when he started going senile and urinating on the floor. After a good month of that, sugar pie and pop, my grandmother and grandfather, put him in the teenage nursing home. I remember that after a few days, the family just stopped coming to see him. As a young teen, I would visit him by myself and he'd make the mistake of calling me my Uncle Maurice, and then he'd ask for everyone. And no one came. He died shortly thereafter. And then there was Pop. <laughs> Pop's name was Henry Webb. He was a very light-skinned man of Trinidadian descent. Most of his family resided in New York and were well-to-do. He worked for Spot the Juvenile Detention Center in the Bronx, and Prentice Hall Publishing in Inglewood Cliffs, New Jersey. My gray area with Pop was that my mother used to say that he's not her real father and that her father lived in New York, and his name was Rudolph Israel. Well, we visited Rudy a few times at his Riverside Drive apartment and met his son and daughter, who I thought were quite aloof. 
to be our uncle and aunt. During the time span of our visits, he had two different wives who were both very nice and always cooked fried fish for us. We always had a great time. Like once a year or so, Rudy was a very dark-skinned man with very strong West African features, and I'm down with that. But he didn't look anything like my mother, who was a caramel complexion with Asian eyes and Native American high cheekbones. So something always seemed strange about that relationship. My friends would always tell me how I resembled Pop. Now, Pop <laughs> looked like the comedian Red Fox, and Sugar Pie looked like the singer Gladys Knight. When we'd be out on vacation, people would come up to them and say, Hey, aren't you? And Pop would say, I know, I know, I'm Red Fox and she's Gladys Knight. And he and Sugar Pie would start laughing. Sometimes they would let the people know it's just a resemblance. And other times, they'd let them go on about their business. I thought it was hilarious. One of Pop's cousins was Isaac from the then hit show The Love Boat. My sister Kim and I were so excited when we knew we were going to see him at my Aunt Nora's Riverside Drive apartment. And when we got there, he was all business like, Hi, how are you? And he kept talking grown up talk. We were like, Damn, on the love boat, he was this happy go lucky guy. So he could really act. Pop's relatives covered the gamut from dentists to West Coast pimps who would visit the house for dinners and parties. But regardless of people's status, we all had good conversation, dancing, jokes, cards, checkers, and chess playing, and family fun. Pop was a hard worker and was quick to embarrass people. Like my father and Shaka, he was another loud one. One time a lady from the inner city was over and she broke a piece of his outdoor furniture and she apologized. But he said in front of everyone, people who don't have nothing are always messing up what other people have. You know, people were trying to hold their faces together after that one, trying not to laugh. Another time, when I was engaged, my fiance's family had come over to one of the basement parties for the first time. The basement was like a club with an early version of a flat screen TV, a full bar, a boutique, a Japanese room, and a raised platform that could be a stage or you could put a dining room table on it. They used to have fashion shows down there too. Well, Pop is drunk and pulls out a butcher knife and tells everyone that I'm not doing anything with my life. Awkward. In my defense, I always kept a job and I did well in school. You just couldn't win with Pop. He would just mow his grass and pick his weeds. He'd do half the block for people for free, knowing that some of them would give him a little something, of course. Oh, the pop could dress. He'd take me to the Bally store outlet in New York and buy some nice suede shoes, green or red. He'd also wear Adidas sweatsuits. This was what my friends and I were rocking in the hip-hop era, and my grandfather was on it. I was like, go, Pop. But why did he always buy me a Carvel's ice cream cake and underwear for my birthday or Christmas? Talking about, this is what you need. One time he brought me some orange sneakers, which we called skips. If I would have got caught wearing those, the kids would have laughed me out of town. So I would hide there, but he'd come over and say, where are those sneakers I brought you? In other words, you don't need nothing else. Now you see why I started working, right? Pop was cool. He just had that West Indian tough love. He was there for me at every minor and major event in my life. Pop taught me the importance of being on time and doing things early. He was the driver of the family. He always kept a nice Lincoln Continental. If he said he was going to pick you up at 7 in the morning, you better be ready. He will beep, knock on the door, ring the bell, and yell and fuss like crazy. We'd always arrive about an hour early to a place. He liked to beat traffic. If people didn't offer him gas and toll money, he'd read them their rights. And we the kids would be laughing. My mother too. He also taught me how to do oil changes with the car. This was good. 
Because besides that, no one ever taught me how to do manly things, like work with tools and build things. The most important thing that I learned from Sugar Pie and Pop was to work hard and then party hard. They would save their coins, extra money, get timeshares, and travel the world. They would fuss a little and end the arguments quickly. Sugar Pie and Pop were always going on vacation or to a social event. If they weren't having one at the house, this let me know the importance of taking my lady out and breaking up the monotony of the rat race. It also let me know to do your best to get your money right and most of all, be happy. Oh, I forgot. She always stressed having good credit. They were a happy partying couple all the way into their golden years. Pop even passed away in Aruba lying on his chair by the swimming pool. Sugar Pie passed about a decade later at the age of 87 in Palm Coast, Florida. She was still partying and entertaining down there. I know, because my wife and I partied with her before she passed. Uncle Philip. Uncle Philip was an electrician. His brother, who I believe was his twin, worked for IBM. They seemed really stiff and strictly business, not too kid friendly. I liked them, but like Isaac, they were just a little too serious. So Sugar Pie kept telling me that I should learn how to become an electrician from Uncle Philip. I don't remember, but I'm sure I gave her a nonchalant response. Well, one day Uncle Philip comes over to the house and asks for me to come with him. He starts pulling wires out of the electrical sockets in the den and talking about positive and negative. I had to be about 13. Uncle Philip quickly saw that I had no interest and he gave up. I think adults should take a little more time with young people and communicate the importance of the lesson that they're trying to instill in them. To reach back to young people, it will require a great deal of patience and understanding. Uncle Byron. Uncle Byron looked like an East Indian, but he was Jamaican. I love his wife, Aunt Carol, to this day. She had that snazzy social spirit like sugar pie, and she was a travel agent. My friends and I would fall out and salivate over their daughters, Roxanne and Janine. Even though they my cousins, they were fine. <laughs> they were half Jamaican and half Trinidadian, and absolutely beautiful. They could have sold us to Brooklyn Bridge if they wanted to. We would have picked them up like ancient queens and carried them to the market. But I digressed. Uncle Byron was head of the Bergen County Democratic Party. He was another loud, opinionated man. And he had that sarcastic thing going on, too. Now, I'm starting to see where I get it from. I give, I give it to Uncle Byron. He really tried hard to catch me before I would possibly lose my mind running with my wild friends. Around election time, he'd solicit me to help him distribute democratic literature to people's homes and pass things out. This is where I get some of my marketing from. Hmm. When I brought my first car, Pop helped me learn how to drive. Byron said, a car is a privilege, not a right. I was like, okay. He was trying to tell me not to abuse what I had. I remember working at Bloomingdale's and Riverside Square Mall at the age of 18 and saving $75 for 10 weeks to buy my used car for $750. It was a navy blue Buick. I was very proud of myself. One day Byron and Sugar Pie and another plot to save me from myself and the streets came up with a job for me. Uncle Byron was going to teach me roofing. It must have been 90 degrees on that lady's roof in Inglewood, New Jersey, and I was trying not to slide off of the roof. I was trying to put those shingles in place. They smelled like tar, and I just hated it. I'm thankful that they kept trying, but it's just not what I wanted to do. In later years, Uncle Byron passed away from prostate cancer, and I miss him. The rest of his family is still around, his son, Stephen Witter, is a financial advisor and always tries to assist the family when someone passes away, etc. And I admire and look up to him for his career focus and assistance. All right, next guy, I'm going to call him Uncle X, out of respect. 
Out of respect for the family, I will call this Uncle X. He stayed at my house once as he visited us. He left his designer clothing, towels, belts, sheets, and cologne. I mean, he had the top of the line gear. He had been a military police turned Madison Avenue businessman. There used to be a store called The Sharper Image, and it had all of the new George Jetson type technology. He would give us birthday and Christmas gifts from there. We would love it. We were cool. He was like a big brother to me. He had a serious temper though. It must run in the family. He had style and liked to party. He was definitely a hit with the ladies. So I learned a lot about charming him from him as he was handsome. He had that Billy D. Williams thing going on. I always wanted to hang out with him at the Silver Shadow Club in Manhattan, but it was for like 25 and up or something like that while I was a teen. To make a long story short, he had a long-term struggle with crack cocaine. I mean, a couple of decades. Eventually, I believe his immune system was weak and he passed away. I miss him. Uncle Johnny. Now, my Uncle Johnny was and is the coolest of the cool. He's the cool mod of the family. He's about six foot six and dresses real fly. He rocks that hat and all. He's a lifetime Bronx dude. As a kid, I used to get mad at him because he might show up at Thanksgiving and funerals. I wanted to see him more. I used to be like, what is he into? But I kept it to myself. When my mother was sick and after she passed from ovarian cancer, he and his wife Caroline, Caroline actually, started having major holiday dinners over at their Tracy Towers apartment in the Bronx. The timing was perfect because Sugar Pie and my mother used to have that covered. And with them gone, we needed that warm family feeling that we were used to. Now, Uncle Johnny is on Facebook. What? We're in touch, and it warms my heart. John Currents. When my mother first moved the family from Teaneck to Hackensack, New Jersey, we lived on Main Street in Salem, above a Greek restaurant, which was next to a lingerie shop and a Chinese restaurant. Across the street and about half a block down was A2B Electronics. This six foot dark skinned bald head, thick glasses with a big smile. Man would always be sticking his head out of the shop and he was always flirting with my mother. I think she flirted back too. He would say, where's your mother? Tell her I'm looking for her. That woman is fine. I'd shake my head. When he found out that I rapped and spit poetry, he'd always say, what you got? What you got? Kick a little something for me. So I'd kick it on the street or in the store. He'd always let me promote my tapes and flyers in the store. When I didn't see him in a while, he'd say, always remember your family. I'm family. Come to think of it, he was another loud and proud one. <laughs> When I had gained a little weight, he'd point to my stomach and say, no, you have to get rid of that. So I'd try to duck him <laughs> if, I, if I saw him so I wouldn't have to hear his mouth. I learned that he had a few sons, some of whom I had met. They were very mature and college bound. I also learned that he's a major martial artist. His business advice to me was, the color of money is green. He knew that I was on that black power vibe, so he was just trying to let me know not to limit myself. I must have known John now for over 25 years. I never would have thought that a man who owned a shop would become someone I could trust and confide in. Time has passed. It's passed by fast, and he too is my Facebook friend. It's always great now when I see him in person. I don't want to avoid him anymore. I want to enjoy his company. To this day, he'll laughingly say, your mother was a fine woman. I am forever thankful to and for these great men in my life that filled the void 
even when I couldn't see it or recognize it. This may seem strange, but with all of my appreciation, there was still a void. There was still a lack of emotional connection. I guess only one person can truly be your father. I say that because these men chipped in, but couldn't stay around. It's like that movie that is so good that you don't want it to go off, but the credits keep rolling down, and then the lights come back on in the theater, and you realize that you are back to life, back to reality, while still being thankful for the experience. Wasn't Supposed to Make It by Kamal Amani, Chapter 7, My Spiritual Giants. In my quest for religious, spiritual satisfaction and knowledge of self, the Creator has blessed me with some strong and very wise men. They are giants in the community, and even though we don't or didn't always meet eye to eye, I love and respect their hearts and minds. I also learned courage leadership, focus, consistency, clarity, and balance from each of them. They have invested time, support, and spiritual wisdom in me. These men are Michael and Munir Muhammad, Brother Edward Muhammad, Dr. Leonard Jeffries, Sheikh Latif Ali, Imam Pasha Salahuddin, Ron Alexander, and Pastor Robert Goldstein. I Wasn't Supposed to Make It by Kumal Amani, Chapter 8, No Time for Hesitation. The eternal words of prodigy, rest in peace, of the hip-hop group Mob Deep says, no time for hesitation, it only leads to incarceration, represents the survival instinct of human beings. In fact, it is said by many that the origin of hip-hop is due in part to the politicians' decisions to take the instruments out of the schools. That was in the inner cities. With this being done, the reaction was to human beatbox, rap, and DJ using your parents' living room turntables, amplifiers, speakers, and adding mixes, etc. Without the ability to form a band, you formed a crew, rocked the party, and got paid for it. I give this much emphasis in this book because the origin and evolution of hip hop from inner city youth to a billion dollar industry is truly miraculous and making a lot of people prosperous. This was the vibe in the Bronx when I was about six years old in 1972. You can feel the hustle spirit of sweet survival in the air. There was a song that we love to this day whose lyrics say, Children playing, women producing, men go to work and some go stealing. Everyone's got to make a living. Due to watching my mother struggle and faint and beg my little sister's father and my father for money as well as my grandmother for money, I didn't hesitate. I instinctively went over to the corner supermarket and started asking the ladies who had just finished shopping if I could help them carry their bags home. Not one of those ladies ever said no. So I would either walk several blocks or jump in a cab with them and then bring their bags up the stairs to their apartments. They would give me an average of $5, which was big for a six year old in the 70s. Not once did I have to worry about being harmed while working my new hustle. This was the beginning of my entrepreneurial spirit. When I moved out to Teaneck, New Jersey at the age of nine, my friends and I would rake people's leaves and shovel snow from their walkways and driveways. 
we would also cut people's roses off of their rose bushes, bundle them up, and sell it back to them. They would laugh and give us some money. After a day of shoveling snow, we'd all come home with at least $100 in our pockets. Then, at around the age of 11, we found out that we could work on a municipal truck once a week and pick up bottles and cans from people's homes for recycling. For a few hours, they would pay us $7 and give us all the fountain soda that we could drink, and we were good with that. Okay. Why we find out that the man at Carvel's would give you $7 for a carton of Newport or Marlboro cigarettes so that he could resell them. Once our friends flashed that money, we'd start going into the local supermarket and lifting cartons of cigarettes. I know, this is a bad example, but it's the truth. Kids, don't try this at home. Luckily, we didn't get caught. But as I grew older, I learned that you can get in trouble for taking something as small as paper clips home from a job, so it's not worth it. On the more positive side of things, I would go over my grandmother's house every Sunday and clean her mirrors, blinds, carpets, and dust her tables all for $10. Of course, I'd get candy, cake, soul food, West Indian rice and peas, and ice cream. But most of all, when I finished, or thought I was finished, she would show me how to step back and look at my work and redo some things, and then come back and get her for her approval. And then we'd sit down and talk. She'd instill a lot of good wisdom into me. More on that later. I guess people sort of hustle with me, and like my grandmother Sugar Pie would say, boy, you keep a job, and she would laugh. I guess when that survival instinct kicks in, combined with the love for your mother, it gives you a lion heart. The lesson. If you're hungry for success, where there's a will, there's a way. There are no excuses. If you're at the bottom, that means you don't have anything to lose. There's only one way to go, and that's up. You have to get out of your comfort zone. Dream. Visualize. Visualize your goal and start working on creating your reality. In the next chapter, I will emphasize the secret ingredient. I Wasn't Supposed to Make It by Kamal Amani. Chapter 9. Your mind is infinite. Your mind is infinite. I just wanted to pull over here for a moment to let you know that whatever your mind can conceive and believe, it can achieve. That for every problem, the solution already exists. For every question, the answer already exists. You can think your way through anything if you practice the art of relaxing, staying patient and calm, and listening to your inner voice. You can figure it out. Just remember that great things aren't built overnight. There's an old saying, Rome wasn't built in a day. Every day do something towards achieving your goal. Do something towards chipping away at your problems. Little things eventually turn into big things. Small actions gain inertia and start growing into your desired outcome. I once heard Oprah Winfrey say that when you want to achieve something, take a deep breath and visualize the outcome. Your mental vision has to be crystal clear and then you have to act with a laser beam focus and nonstop persistence to achieve your goals. Most people are in a comfort zone. So if they don't support you or think you're acting crazy, don't sweat it. They don't have your mission. Just do you. They'll understand later. Lesson. Keep visualizing your goals daily. Write your goals down. Read them every morning and every night. Act on them, and your subconscious mind will attract the people, places, and things into your life that will help you to achieve your goals. Just be prepared and alert enough to see from whence your help comes. I Wasn't Supposed to Make It by Kamal Amani Chapter 10 Ignorance on Fire is Better Than Intelligence on Ice Ignorance on Fire 
is better than intelligence on ice. At the age of 16, it was on and popping. It was the 1980s and the Sugar Hill Gang from neighboring Englewood, New Jersey had the first rap record that I ever heard on the radio. My crew was inspired. After school, I worked part-time at a company called Dial America where I learned a bit about sales and marketing. And in the summers, we'd work cleaning up the parks in Teaneck for DPW. This gave us the money to buy DJ equipment and cassette tapes. We'd be up in my room, the infamous attic, rapping, cutting and scratching, and making tapes of it as the Asiatic Brothers. The tapes would circulate around northern New Jersey, and we'd get called and booked to do house parties. We'd get from $300 to $500 per party. And then we started renting out BFWs, Elks Lodges, community centers, church basements, and women's clubs. We'd make these cheesy flyers with graffiti fonts and hip-hop b-boy and b-girl images. Sometimes black and white and sometimes on color paper, 11 times 10 with the date, time, place, and price, such as $7 before 9 p.m. and $10 after. On the flyer, it would state, roses to the first 25 ladies. So we'd buy roses from the gas station and give them to the first 25 ladies. They say, oh, thank you, and they smile. And we say, you're welcome, and laugh. But it was all working. We'd have to get insurance for some of the places and always pay our hard rock friends to be security. Plus, we were security. We weren't trying to let anyone mess up our money flow. We learned to start promoting around two weeks in advance. We developed a mailing list and would mail flyers to all the people on the list. We'd also take them to polls in all the parks, main streets, bus stops, supermarkets, barbershops, beauty parlors, nail salons, libraries, etc. And we usually have big turnouts, 200 to 400 people. We learned to even pay off duty cops to stand at the door with their PAL hat on as a great deterrent. In the future, when I was in my late 20s, my partner Prince and I would throw parties in Hackensack, New Jersey, and the BFW and Club 80. There was big money made, but always fights, and sometimes the threat of weapons, so we had these bodybuilding bouncers with licensed guns and pit bulls. This is when I decided to do poetry and gospel events. We also found out that we could charge vendors $25 to $50 to set up a table and sell food, clothing, jewelry, and music, or take pictures for sale. That was more money, more money, more money. So the above party promotion techniques became a template for us that we could use to do a lot of parties and make a lot of money for some young kids without a manual. Lesson, just do it. If you have an idea, use all of your resources. Don't let what you don't have stop you. Don't let what other people say stop you. Go for it. Yes, you will make some mistakes. You will look crazy at times. People will let you down. But as Jay-Z would say, you're going to learn today. If you can take what you have learned from trying, failing, and succeeding, you can use that wisdom and apply it to all your future life endeavors. Remember, ignorance on fire is better than intelligence on ice. I wasn't supposed to make it. Chapter 11. What's your purpose in life? Lessons from Sugar Pie. After cleaning my grandmother Sugar Pie's house on Sundays and trying to duck my Trinidadian grandfather Pop so he wouldn't give me more work picking weeds or gutters, Sugar Pie would be laying on her bed and I would be on the chase next to her bed. We'd watch the black news programs like like It Is with Gil Noble on Channel 7, Tony Brown's Journal on Channel 13, and The McCrary Report. We'd also watch shows like Meet the Press. She'd ask me my opinion on certain subjects and give me hers. She was a retired secretary for the NAACP in New York City and would have dignitaries and professionals over the house a lot. She had a healthy respect for the Jewish community. She liked how they handled money and she would always stress the importance of the bar mitzvah, which I later learned is similar to the African and indigenous rites of passage. She'd say, 
You know, when a Jewish boy becomes 13, he knows exactly what he wants to do. He's a man. The community comes around and supports him. That would resonate with me. My main problem in seeking early career clarity was that I knew I wanted to be in broadcasting or study astronomy. When her and my aunt asked me what did I want to do when I grew up, and I told them, they said, you should want to be the first black president. Huh? Side note, Sugar Pie always stressed the importance of having good credit. She'd say, if you can't pay them, it all makes sure you still communicate with them. If you have to send them just $10, then do it. If you can't, then write them a letter. With good credit, you can have anything that you want. Along with my mother being very hands-offish and liberal with me, which I appreciate because it allowed me to experiment and become a risk taker. My father, who was a superintendent in Washington Heights, who wanted me to be a handyman like him. My grandfather, Pop, who worked for Spofford Juvenile Detention Center in the Bronx, would say to me, why don't you sign up for the post office or to be a toll collector? There was also my little sister's father, Shaka Zulu, a Garvey, who would say, learn business and accounting, science and engineering, so you can go back and help Africa. My loving and very light-skinned and Lena Horn-looking aunt, pop sister from Riverside Drive in Harlem, would call weekly just to say, I sent you the Ebony Magazine and get your education, get your education. My grandmother would always chime in and say, that's right, you gotta have that piece of paper referring to a degree. My drunk aunt was sometimes here on the family grapevine that I wasn't doing what the family thought I was supposed to be doing. So when I'd see her, she'd say, what are you doing with yourself? And before I could answer, she'd grunt and say, you ain't doing nothing. And I'd just leave. All of these demands made me a little rebellious. <laughs> I was already making money with my hip hop and jobs so I was like, how could I stay away from these people as much as possible? What Sugar Pie was getting at with the Bar Mitzvah story was that you should be clear about what you want to do, especially at an early age, because other people are ready and you will have to deal in the world with them. I inherently knew this or learned from her because at one point as a teen, I started asking everyone, girls in particular, what's your purpose in life? I would laugh inside and at the generic template answers such as to have a good job, a house, a spouse, two cars, and a dog. I respected the ideal, but from my struggling upbringing, I said to myself, something is bound to go wrong with this perfect vision. Now, don't get me wrong, I love to vision material things. My concern was their lack of internal purpose. I was looking for something with more substance, such as service to humanity, to help others, or to change a particular situation in the world. And later in life, many of these people did run into a culture shock when their perfect vision didn't manifest the way, the when, and the how they thought it would. I think when you have a strong sense of purpose, nothing can take you out of your game. What's your purpose in life? I wasn't supposed to make it. Chapter 12, Charm em. My grandmother Sugar Pie used to tell me how she used to go into the bank with her good credit to get a loan so she could take an extravagant vacation as she was a world traveler. She said she'd wear her best, her jewels, her wig, and her fur coat. She was a sophisticated diva for sure. She would ask for a loan for some mundane reason, but she was really going to use the extra money to travel, and she'd get it. When she knew that I was going for a job interview, she'd say, you know what to do, charm them, and she'd smile and laugh. You know how to do it. Use that handsome charm that you have. I use it to this day. It's like it's in my DNA. If 
I go into an interview and there are women there especially, I pretty much know that I got the job. I can impress some men too. I come with the suit, trench coat, clean cut, briefcase, and I'm ready to have a conversation. I'm ready to show them how much I would love working for their company as I am a satisfied customer and or I love what I noticed when I researched it. I'm interested in growing with the company and their management training program. I can be a leader or a follower, and I'm a team player. I also realize that client customer service is of the utmost importance and how client retention is extremely important for business. I learned these things from working for various retail establishments, publishing and financial corporations in my 20s and 30s. So later in my 40s, as a special education teacher, I would teach interviewing and life skills to my so-called at-risk, emotionally disturbed students who would include gangs like the Bloods and Crips and students with electronic ankle bracelets. I even entrained with my students by letting them know that we have a lot in common. Like many of them, I too didn't have a father around. Some of my best friends were killed due to gang violence. Others are still rotting in jail. Many are addicted to drugs, or they snap psychologically due to the pressures of society. In this way, charm them simply means communicate and let them know that you're here to serve them. You're not in their lives to bring more drama, but to lessen the drama. You're here to bring more clarity and peace to their lives. The world pays big money for problem solvers. When you walk in, you should exude optimism, confidence, and look like the person who can solve all of their problems. Lesson. Using your magnetism should be second nature. If you're an attractive, funny, intelligent, or a great dresser, don't hide it. Use what you got to get what you want. It only helps. In business, social, and networking situations, Always put on your best. You can literally walk through some VIP doors and get invited to a lot of places if you're bringing your charisma to the party or meeting. People like interesting and confident people. Charm I wasn't supposed to make it. Chapter 13. Where my dog's at. When you find yourself, by yourself. One of my favorite rappers, DMX, asked the question, where my dog's at? And so singer Teddy Pendergrass with Harold Melvin and the Blue Note said, where are all my friends? And singer Jody Watley sang, friends won't be around. Friends will let you down. When you need the most, where are your friends? In my personal experience, I've had a lot of fun. At first, working in an entrepreneurial capacity with groups. I had a real estate investment group, a recording studio in Hackensack, New Jersey. As indicated earlier, I promoted talent showcases as well as entrepreneur expos. When things are going well, everyone is cool. But when things go wrong, things could get nasty. I found that when one person isn't clearly the boss, the chief decision maker, people start making up their own rules. Like one time we had a no check policy in our recording studio and one out of three partners decided to let someone pay a couple of hundred dollars worth of check. Well, the check bounced. Then he tried to chase the client down and work out a new payment arrangement. Funds also were commingled and people didn't pay the bills on time. The bad part about all of this is the excuses that people come up with and they expect you to accept them because they're your friends. I've also had people habitually late to their own event and couldn't understand why I was salty. The people shouldn't arrive before the host or the promoter, okay? One of my favorite situations is when your partner says, oh, I don't have my uh, portion of the money. But they have on new Gucci boots, new gold jewelry, 
a new hairdo, etc. But we're supposed to be sacrificing a few things to move this business forward. I say to myself and eventually to them, you might as well go ahead and party and I'll concentrate on doing the business. I learned that I'm either the leader or I'm a supporter of a good leader. But trying to be equals with everything 50-50 or 33 and a third, 33 and a third, 33 and a third isn't going to work. It does work for some people, but it's something for you to consider. Where my dog's at. Lesson. Your dream is your baby. Don't let anyone mess it up. Protect it at all costs. Also remember that your reputation is at stake. When your partner drops the ball, the client looks at you. Where my dog's at. I wasn't supposed to make it. Chapter 14, Bounce Back. I love Big Sean's song, Bounce Back. Sometimes you take that L, that loss, but you must remember your why, your purpose, and your reason for doing your thing. You must regroup and bounce back. In Sun Tzu's book, The Art of War, he says, when you're weak, appear strong. When you're strong, appear weak. And the art of war is deception. Everyone doesn't have to know your every step because as KRS-One says, real bad boys move in silence. So when you slip, trip, stagger, or fall, they don't have to know it. In war, sometimes you advance. When you run into an ambush or hostile territory, you might have to retreat, surrender, or feign surrender. This is only so you can regroup and fight another day. Sometimes you have to choose your battles. In the process of grinding or goal attainment, you have to monitor your energy. You don't want to expend your energy on foolishness, and when you need it for something major, it has dissipated. Sometimes you have to fall back and re-examine your plans or re-strategize. You don't have to quit. You have to renew. Whatever you like to do that relaxes you, and get you in a zone where you can let go and regroup. If it's good for you, then do it. For me, I like to take herbal baths with some herbs in the water like chamomile, rose, lime, etc. I have the incense lit and the music playing. Some jazz, reggae, zen, sufi, or neo soul. I like it nice and hot like a steam bath. I might chant or pray while I'm in there. When I get out, I feel like a new man. Sometimes walking in nature, jogging, or playing basketball will totally take my mind off the problems of the world today, as the fearless four of us say. I also love to read. When you open a book, it's like you have wings. You can travel anywhere. You can learn all kinds of things. I can go to a bookstore and get some herbal tea or organic coffee and a book, and I'm out of here. I also like to get real estate books and practice creative visualization. That's by like looking at the homes and everything. I love comedy. I love the weigh-ins, Bernie Mac, Richard Pryor, Bill Cosby, Trevor Noah, Cat Williams, Steve Harvey, Ari Spears, Dave Chappelle, Martin Lawrence, Tyler Perry, Steve Martin, Millie Jackson, and Paul Mooney to say the least. In the book, The Greatest Salesman in the World by author O.G. Mandino, he says, I will laugh at the world. <laughs> Don't let anything get and keep you down. Also learn to laugh at myself. It takes the sting out of others who try to laugh at you, and it's not good to take yourself too seriously. Like you don't make mistakes. Don't be too hard on yourself. I love to read spiritual books of all persuasions. I also love the law of attraction, positive thinking, and self-help books. We must always think positive and be optimistic. Always think positive and be optimistic. I used to think that was corny, but I learned that it's magical and necessary. I also take vitamins and herbs, especially B-complex, hemohem, ginseng, vitamin C, vitamin D, saw palmetto, zinc, calcium magnesium, and much more. 
Look these up and you'll see why. I also tried to drink a lot of water. I believe in God, health, and money. Then I can help my family and community. Lesson. When you continually love yourself and you take a blow or fall, it's easier to bounce back than when you don't grieve. You have to grieve. You have to keep it real with yourself. You know, and, and just don't give up. Don't give up. Always muster up the energy to bounce back. Go back to the cipher. Go back to zero. Go back to total surrender. And then get back up in advance. Always self-examine and monitor your self-thoughts. Stay positive. Negative thoughts bring you down and positive thoughts bring you up. I said negative thoughts bring you down and positive thoughts bring you up. So go all the way up. All right? Peace. Bounce back. I wasn't supposed to make it. Chapter 16. Supreme Hustle. The importance of entrepreneurship. Quote. These things called computers do the working for a man, leaving one man on the buttons while unemployed are ten. Unquote. The feel is for problems of the world today. The traditional jobs are gone. Where your 9 to 5 job used to be your plan A and your entrepreneurial activities used to be your side hustle. I think you have to keep in mind the reverse. Yes, work there while you have to. Do your best, shine and charm them, and try to keep most of your side hustle endeavors to yourself if the corporate culture might frown upon it. For a lot of people, their boss and their job is God. So anything else looks sacrilegious. You look like a heathen and a runaway slave to them when they see that you are trying to do for self. So be careful that they don't snitch or try to set you up. I digressed. What I wanted to say is that Easy Pass has taken the jobs of toll collectors. Pop, my grandfather didn't see that one coming. He used to tell me to become a toll collector. Computers have taken the place of cashiers, bank tellers, ATMs, laptops, and tablets are starting to teach school children. The traditional job used to afford you a better sense of security. You worked for many years until retirement, and you received a company pin, a watch, and retirement package. Those days are gone. Those days are gone. It's good to repackage yourself, and many companies will hire you as a consultant, you may not receive benefits, but you may be able to work from home or come in and help to solve their problems. And they will reward you with a nice amount of money. Being an independent consultant in your field is something you should set yourself up for. So develop your website, social media, and get your business cards so that you will always be prepared for an opportunity. It's critical to find a niche. Something that's in demand that you can do well and differently, better, more affordable, or more efficient than your competitor. And you can become very successful in your field. Always research and watch for stable and or trending investment opportunities that allow your money to work for you. That allow your money to work for you so you won't have to work hard for the money. Lesson, when you do something that you love, it doesn't feel like you're working for it. There's nothing like the feeling of being independent. Supreme Hustle, the importance of entrepreneurship. I wasn't supposed to make it. Chapter 15. It's all about money. Quote. It's all about money ain't a damn thing funny. Grandmaster Melly Mel. Sometimes the obvious isn't clear when we have all of these distractions. Some people get what I'm about to say and some people don't. But in this capitalistic economic structure, after God, your life force. And oxygen, you need 
money. When there was a power outage in New York City in the late 1990s, I was on a business trip in Hampton, Virginia, setting up some radio and show promotions when my wife called and told me that she and everyone in the New York, New Jersey area was in the dark. I laughed because I was chilling in Virginia Beach area and everything was lovely. I took the Greyhound back into New York and once I arrived, I usually just go up the escalator and get on a bus in the Port Authority that would take me to my New Jersey residence in about 45 minutes. Well, the escalators weren't working. The buses weren't working. And this was before everyone had cell phones. So I had to buy a phone card so I could use the pay phone. But the ATMs weren't working. An African cab driver whose offer I had politely refused when I first thought I was going to the store to get a phone card was delighted when I had to surrender to his request and let him drive me to New Jersey. Good thing I had $50 on me. Cash. This was one of the times in my life when I realized the power and importance of money. If I wouldn't have had that $50 and couldn't call anyone, I would have been plain stuck or I would have taken a long walk home. If you're broke, you may not be able to get air for your car tire or a clean drink of water, depending on where you are. You won't be able to apply for a job online or take a bus to get to the job interview. And you may not be able to eat a nutritious meal. So let's deal with the opposite of that. Picture working hard and working smart and always having money in abundance. This is where we want to be. Get rid of all of the thoughts and sayings that are bad about money and start thinking positive thoughts about obtaining, having, saving, and investing money. As Reverend Ike and Bishop E. Bernard Jordan would say, make your mind a money magnet. Make your mind a money magnet. Get money. This is the lesson. Get money, but don't lose your soul. Stay balanced. Be able to be happy with it or without it. But know that in this world, it's of utmost importance and the bills never stop coming. So you want the money to always flow to you as well. Get money. I wasn't supposed to make it. Chapter 17, Bees in the Trap. Bees in the Trap? You have unlimited potential, infinite intelligence, so much talent. I have seen some of my special education students beat the staff members consistently in checkers, chess, and cards. I have seen them dance, sing, model, crack jokes, excel in math, art, reading, speech, science, culinary arts, computers, and group leadership. However, the illegal hustling spirit of the streets pulls them back in. As corny as it seems and may sound, you have to be good. You have to be righteous. What goes around does really come around. What you put out comes back to you. And what you do in the dark comes out in the light. You will get caught. So don't give them an excuse to lock you up and fuel their pockets through the privatized prison industrial system. Or use and sell your body parts after you're killed in the street. Yes, it's a trap. Don't get caught in the trap. Bees in the trap. I wasn't supposed to make it. Chapter 18. Develop the leader in you. Develop the leader in you. After leaving the Bronx, New York to escape gangs, crime, and drugs, I was to quickly find the same vices in suburban New Jersey. There were some notorious drug dealers living out there. And why were we 10 minutes from the George Washington Bridge, Washington Heights, and 20 minutes from Harlem? When we had study halls and lunch breaks, we would run over to the city to get our share of stimulants. Then some of my friends started robbing almost every house in our neighborhood to get money for clothes and drugs. Of course, there were girls who liked all of the fun too. 
Then some of my boys felt the need to get guns for protection from rival posses. We always carried meat cleavers, hammers, knives, brass knuckles, and nunchucks. With the DJing and MCing and partying in my room, The Attic, see the movie on YouTube, Up in the Attic Hip Hop Throwback Movie, and the soundtrack on iTunes. My mother used to work overtime for AT&T on Canal Street in New York and commute to Teaneck, New Jersey. By the time she got home, she was tired. She made sure me and my two little sisters were fed. We did our homework, and she would lock herself in her room. She'd eat her hostess cupcakes, drink her Coca-Cola, watch TV, and fall to sleep. She was comfortable knowing that no matter what I was doing, she knew that I was safe because I was up in my room. Some of my well-to-do suburban friends couldn't bring drugs, alcohol, and the opposite sex to their parents' houses. So my attic became the nightclub and hangout for those who were down with us, the Asiatic brothers. We had become very popular. We were hood legends, along with our newly found knowledge of self from the nation of gods and earths. We were street astrologers with magnetism. This was in the 1980s. When the Wu-Tang Clan came out years later, they reminded me of us, the way each individual had a unique talent and magnetic personality. On weekends and holidays, we would run the streets and ride or hop the subways from Far Rockaway, Queens to Canarsie, Brooklyn, all over the Bronx and Harlem, and back to Patterson, New Jersey. We would frequent the clubs such as Broadway International, the Roxy, the Red Parrot, the Fever, the Rink in Bergenfield, the Tunnel, Studio 54, Club Sensations, Zanzibar in Newark, the Xena, and CCP in Patterson. If there was a hole in the wall, we were there. We would come to see the groups that we heard on the cassette tapes, such as the Cold Crush, Crash Crew, Foursome Seas, Dougie Fresh, the Juice Crew, KRS, the Treacherous Three, Bam Bada, Master Don and the Death Committee, the Fantastic Four, the Fearless Four, Houdini, Busy B, Rakim, Big Daddy Kane, and much, much more. We loved hanging out on 42nd Street, which was nothing but vice at that time. Porn everywhere, drugs, prostitution, food, drinks, but we loved to watch the karate flicks, play fight, and then take pictures. There were brothers like Infinite, who would take and sell the Polaroid pictures and sell them to us for like $5 and watch out for the cons, like Three Card Molly. On several occasions, we'd be in enemy territory, and one of my friends would be drunk and start trash talking when he knew we were outnumbered and far away from home. I'd tell him in the crew, yo, if he doesn't stop, I'm out. One time he didn't stop. I left, and a few minutes later, I saw him and a few others ride past me in a cop car as I was walking home. They had called me names for leaving, but till this day, I don't have a criminal record. My friends enjoyed going to the Red Parrot. I think it was on 28th Street in New York City. I remember seeing LL there just chilling. But of course, cats started fighting and shooting. One night I said, yo, I'm leaving. They got mad, but when I got home and turned on the news, the ambulance was in front of the club and someone had gotten hurt. When I stopped getting high, I quickly learned who my friends were. I realized the attic wasn't so popular anymore. People were even bad-mouthing me a lot. Also, when I decided to go to church, they went crazy. They, my friends, came to my house trying to psychoanalyze me. This is when I started seeing myself as a leader. It can be lonely, but I'd rather have true unconditional friends and unconditional love around me than parasites and egotistical people. The lesson. You must follow your heart. You must follow your instincts your intuition. The whole world can be going left, but if you decide to go right, then stick with your decision and you will feel your character building. It's good to be a person of integrity, inner power, and conviction. It's good to constantly grow and evolve. Develop the leader in you.
I wasn't supposed to make it. Chapter 19. Gain power. There's a lesson in the nation of gods and earths, and Grand Nubian said it. Save self before saving others. This book has been about self-discovery and self-achievement. You must go hard. You must challenge your fears, and after discouragement or a fall, you must bounce back. But on your way to the top, or when you get there, please realize and remember that in unity, there is power. Not in the individual. You need to have someone's back, and a group of people need to have yours. All ethnic groups consciously work as economic and political units and are respected with the exception of the African American. We must support each other, circulate the dollar among each other, and protect each other. Our women have sacrificed for us, so we shouldn't disrespect them. They are not bitches, they are goddesses and queens. We shouldn't kill their sons, who are our brothers. Western culture and its norms have tricked us into thinking that we are individuals. We will not be successful as narcissists. Our collective goal should be to leave the planet and our community better than how we inherited it and to leave a legacy of history, education, and wealth for our future generations. That's power. So give back to the community. I wasn't supposed to make it. I wasn't supposed to make it. Chapter 20. We gonna make it. We gonna make it. The locks. They say that out of millions of sperm cells, you made it through. You had that willpower. No matter what you've been through or what you're going through, you can make it. You have the power of the creator in you. You're here for a purpose. Think about what that is and go all out like never before. Black out. People think I'm crazy because I get ideas and I don't hesitate. I go to work on them right away. Sometimes they hit and sometimes they miss. Sometimes they're popping and sometimes they pop. But I'm in a zone where I'm like, I'm not going to let my ideas sit on the table or in my head and collect dust. I'm going to put them out there to the world because one of them might make me a billionaire or might simply save someone else. Either way, I left a legacy. Lesson, remember the now. N-O-W, remember the now. So many people who I know and speak with dwell on the past. If so-and-so was alive, why'd my parents do this and that? Their conversation is, I coulda, woulda, shoulda. Others, especially young people, can't see a future for themselves. Well, you have to create a future for yourself. Focus on what you can do today. Focus on what you can do now. Focus on the goal, take control and roll. Let the whole world know that you got soul. Like the atom in the womb of the universe that grew into the sun, you're number one. Be determined and rise like helium. Blast off. We gonna make it. Come all of mine. I wasn't supposed to make it. Chapter 21. The Improvisation of Manhood. No one gave us a manual on how to be a successful man, husband, and father in modern day America. The scriptures might shine some light, but in some situations they may need to be updated or reinterpreted. One such example is that the man is the head of the house. But what about when the woman makes 20,000 to 50,000 more than the man? What happens when she's working and he's unemployed? He can't start talking about he's the man of the house. It's just not logical. I like the saying, a man rules the house and a woman rules the home. To me, it's a good way to make things 50-50, which means that a couple must compromise. I believe the real truth is, which is found in most of nature, that the woman is the queen bee and the men are the workers. Men are here to protect the female and the children and to secure food and territory. When we upgrade this 
we find that a lot of this in today's times means that the man needs to be financially independent and mentally and spiritually balanced. I learned something in my sociology of the family class at Bergen Community College that is simple yet profound. That is the three major causes of divorce. They are communication, money, and sex. Really, the lack of sex. I have been married over 22 years at the time of this writing, and my wife and I have been together for 25 years. Our son is 12 years old. It is pertinent that we take periodic breaks to put down the titles of husband, wife, and parents, and just be friends. You should honestly speak with each other before or when tempers are beginning to flare or emotions are beginning to simmer. We must have couple and family meetings. Otherwise, people tend to hold things in that will explode later. It's the same with the rule that you should not go to bed with a situation that is not settled. We must make peace with each other. This implies forgiveness and dropping one's ego. Many times, we as men think that a woman is simply nagging us. We're like, why is she so mad over the garbage, the dishes, picking up the kids, not going anywhere, etc. But if we would just listen to her and do what she wants, we will find that doing the little things matter. The other side of the coin is, don't try to walk over me. <laughs> so it's a thin line. We want to be sweet with each other at all times. It's hard to do, but that should be the goal. We should always remember that loving, romantic energy that brought us together in the first place. As a family friend and professional told us, it's not you being mad at him or him being mad at you. It's the things in the middle that are the problem. Those things in the middle are finances, health, stress, the job, the kids, etc. If we're not careful, we'll take it out on each other. Like Michael Jackson said, remember the time we fell in love? Remember the time we first met? So men have to be beggars like Babyface, but strong like 50 Cent or Teddy Pendergrass at times. I also learned from Ra'un Nefer Amin in his book, Black Woman's Black Man's Guide to a Spiritual Union, that we all have a script of how the perfect person is supposed to be. And once we really get with them, we find out that perfection breaks down. They're not everything we expected, and then we become disappointed. Here's a very real saying, you don't know someone until you live with them. What we must remember is unconditional love. This is when you can love someone regardless if they fall short of your standards or expectations. You still give selflessly, that selflessly, not expecting anything in return. You do it, you give, because you want to. The same type of communication is needed with intimacy. You got to give the people what they want, not how you want to do it. When it comes to money, I just hustle. And what I mean by that is, if I lose a job, I will fill out 10 applications per day until someone calls me. My phone always rings within 24 hours of a job search. I can't sit around the house because bills and cancellation notices will keep coming and credit scores will get worse. So it's time to go hard. Always stay in pursuit of higher economic goals until you feel comfortable. It's like what 50 Cent said, get rich or die trying. Lesson, be an excellent listener and communicator. Listening is half of communicating, and nonverbal communication is when you don't say what you're going to do, you just do it and let it show. I wasn't supposed to make it. Chapter 22, the side hustle. You must have additional streams of income. Quote, if I was water, I'd flow in the now, unquote, Rakim. We're talking about flow, cash flow. The Nile River in Egypt, Kemet flows upstream. 
And as we flow upstream, we need to say no to people who are parasitic so that we can concentrate on several ventures at once. I like to have money coming. Money comes from my first job as a teacher. My spoken word, hip hop and music generate residual income from CD Baby, iTunes, Tidal, Spotify, Amazon, etc. I also share my excellent Atomi product brand, which brings me passive income. Along with my sister and close family and friends, we promote talent showcases, business expos, and open mics. When I have extra time, I do Uber and stash most of the cash because I learned that one should never be broke. I also do music business consultation and marketing for musicians and small businesses. See Music Business 101 on YouTube. I also get booked to perform spoken word performances and motivational speaking. I like to be able to take a check and save it while I still have additional income coming in. I once met a millionaire brother who told me, if you're doing eight things at one time to get money, don't let any go until one of them takes you to your goal. Now, you need to focus on one major thing, but what I'm talking about is your residual income. If you can set up other things that are coming in, do it. Lesson. In the Bible, there's the story of Jesus wanting you to use all of your talents. Don't hide or save them. Manifest them. I wasn't supposed to make it. Chapter 23. I'll see you at the top. Nothing can stop me. I'm all the way up. Terror Squad. In conclusion, no one gave us the manual on how to become men and women of success. No one gave us the blueprint or master. But we started at the bottom, now we're here. There's a saying, necessity is the mother of invention. This is how hip hop began. When the politicians got rid of the school bands and took instruments out of the schools in New York, the public school system, what did the inner city youth do? They created the human beatbox, the art of making music with turntables and a mixer, rapping, graffiti, and break dancing, and learning knowledge of self. Now hip hop is an integral part of the planet's music. Use your talents to invent and innovate. You can sell bottled water in the summertime for a profit, or you can create an app. You can go to trade school or college. You can find a problem and create a solution for it. Find a way to make life more convenient for people and they will purchase it. Don't make any excuses. Go hard and never quit. Never quit. Do you. When you use your God-given talent, you will become prosperous. I'll see you at the top. I wasn't supposed to make it. I wasn't supposed to make it. Chapter 24. I'm going to share with you some of my favorite quotes. I also have some um, raps in the back, but... Y'all can check me out online for that, all right? <laughs> Some of my favorite quotes. Get out of your comfort zone. Feel the fear and do it anyway. Les Brown. No time for hesitation. It only leads to incarceration. There's a war going on outside no man is safe from. You can run, but you can't hide forever. Prodigy, Mob D. No matter how hard you try, you can't stop us now. Africa Bambada, Soul Sonic Force. I thought I told you that we won't stop. Uh uh. P. Diddy. I've heard of Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, but I've never heard of Someday, Reverend Ike. Find the Thief Within, Bishop E. Bernard Jordan. If you don't pay attention, you're going to pay somebody. Pastor Victoria Brown. When you fall down, get back up. Malcolm X. Challenge your fears. The Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. What man has done, man can do. The Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey. Get up, stand up. Stand up for your rights. Get up, stand up. 
Don't Give Up the Fight, Peter Tosh and Bob Marley. Self-control is number one. Self-control is number one. Miss Harper, cafeteria age, Teaneck High School. You got to hustle. You got to hustle. Charles Wilson, stepfather. The color of money is not white or black. The color of money is green. Green. John Currents. You're going to have bigger fights than this, Kamal. Billy Bates. A.K.A. Billy Black, Teaneck, New Jersey, via Brooklyn, New York. You might win, but you're going to know you was in a fight. Come on, Amani. Heaven is when you meet your enemy on the battlefield, Sister Minister Ava Muhammad. To every question, the answer already exists. Bishop E. Bernard Jordan. You know what? I will hit you with these rhymes real quick. A few bars. Ayo, hey, Herod and Pharaoh has put out an order to manslaughter all sons and daughters of the Most High because they can't see why we don't die, we multiply. So Hitler inflicts your brain with malt liquor. Your sperm takes a U-turn, the juice hits you. The flicks we get to pick the ghetto picture of jungle bunnies and money hungry for a gunshot, a piss pot, a crack rock, and a hottie that can't stop the body body rock, body body rock. We got to resurrect like X, be scientists, supreme architects, Kamal Amani. And from Stop Your Violence, part and Stop the Violence with Neva, newblackmusic.net, where's your set? Where's your set when you wet in the ambulance, left for dead, head singing to the feds? Where's your soldiers at when the guns clap, the blood splash, the blocks hot, you gotta lock your dogs in cock? Needle and witness protection, yo. Babies die, mothers cry, another funeral. Who's to blame? All you ever spread was pain. Who's to blame? All you ever shared was pain. Where's the love? You spreading blood over ghetto terrain. It's a shame you won't walk on the positive planes. Time to man up. Follow your dreams for a change. You think you built for this? But at the end of the day, don't let your set fool you. There's a better way. Stop the violence. Come on, Supreme AK. Come on, Imani. I wasn't supposed to make it, so let's make it. Let's make it happen. Thank you for listening. Kamal Lamani, a.k.a. Kamal Supreme, I'm out. Positive elevation. Keep on elevating. Keep living your dreams. Go hard. Do you. One love. Peace.
to fall flat. If they only knew the infinite potential, they'd be bigger than the block international. If your skills was applied to the legal hustle, you monopolize and nobody could crush you. But I'm preaching and y'all ain't trying to hear. I just hope one day it seeps into your spirit, 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 spirit. Yo, yo, they got a trap, yo. They got a trap, they got a trap, yo. They got a trap, they got a trap, yo. They got a trap, I try to tell them the cats to fall back. They got a trap, yo. They got a trap, they got a trap, yo. They got a trap, they got a trap, yo. They got a trap, I try to tell them the cats to fall back. Working hard every day, we do it for the love. Working hard every day, we do it for the love. The question of the times, will the black man be a coward or self-empowered? Will he empower his women, children, and family? Or will he dwell on the block of chemical weed smoke and irresponsibility? Being a pawn in the game of the prison industrial complex. Immature boys masquerading as pimps, players and connoisseurs of sex. Killing their brother man from the motherland for the other man's contraband. Cause you don't understand or overstand that you're being set up for a genocidal plan. You ain't a real man if you ain't taking care of your fam. And a real man is worth more than a job with a billion. So what's it gonna be, T-H-U-G? You gonna build this real empire with me? The ancestors and babies are waiting for us to rise higher, inspire, man up, let's build this empire, come on. Working hard every day, we do it for the love. Working hard every day, we do it for the love. Empire, let's build this empire. Let's build this empire. Let's build this empire. Young black aboriginal, the world is waiting for you to man up, stand up, get a plan up, pull your pants up, be responsible, and pull your plan up. Put your woman back on her throne, respect, never neglect, leaving her and the babies alone, cause you're God's son, so never run from the Babylon system. When you do the right thing, you inherit the kingdom, and leave a legacy for your children. See real men, build family, which becomes community. You become an elder and OG, and the collective consciousness and historical memory. The world is waiting for you to leave a legacy. So let's work together and never tire, inspire, set the world on fire, and build the empire. Working hard every day, we do it Come for on. the love. Let's build this empire. Working hard every day, we do it for the love. Let's build this empire. Empire. Let's build this 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 empire.
just build the same fire. Working hard every day, we do it for the love. Working hard every day, we do it for the love. Working hard every day, we do it for the love.